I got a lot of great feedback on this article in my newsletter up on my website at craigpeterson.com, and it's about mobile malware. Did you know there are 10 different, completely different flavors of malware and what to do about it? I like the analogy of the having your home and having windows in the house and having doors, front door, back door, let's keep it simple, and a couple of windows out front and a couple of windows in the back, and comparing that to your computer or your mobile phone. We're going to talk about your mobile smartphone right now. But what's the comparison, you might ask? You know, the house, of course, is going to be a lot bigger. Well, both of them are subject to attack by bad guys, those hosers that want to suck all of your money out of your bank accounts and out of your house. So what do you do with your home? Well, you might put up security cameras. You might have an alarm system. But at the very least, you're going to lock the doors, right? You're going to lock the front door, you're going to lock the back door, you're going to make sure the windows are closed and locked. And, you know, if somebody really, really wants to get in, they can certainly break in through the glass, maybe knock the door down. But it's going to be pretty obvious. And frankly, most bad guys aren't going to go to that length to get into your house to kind of poke around. In my case, we had an air conditioner in a window and they pulled that air conditioner out of the window into the garden with the intent of course to climb into my house but i have a great dane in the house and she scared the would-be burglar off right makes sense well if you don't lock your windows there are ways to get in and the same thing is true when it comes to your mobile devices i was on with one of the subscribers to my newsletter she had hit respond and to one of my emails or hit reply and said she was having problems because she had been hacked and that her email had been hacked and so i spent them over an hour with her and kind of went through okay why do you think you're we're hacked and what's going on as it turns out she got a phishing email looked exactly like it was from microsoft there is a couple of things in the wording that if you're a computer guy or gal you probably would have looked at the wording of that email and say you know that's definitely not how this works but it will fool most people it basically it fooled my dad as well and he fell a victim to all of that sort of stuff so they're always trying to get in get around send phishing phishing emails to try and spam you out of existence right all of these emails it get, gets so annoying i'm getting so many of them the good news is most of them are blocked and and our email filters that we use for our clients that are provided by cisco those email filters are blocking thousands tens of thousands actually of these malicious pieces of email that are trying to come in and you know a little bit about that. But did you realize that your smartphone is also susceptible to some of these, particularly if you're using an Android device? I, I know, Craig. You, I knew you were going to go there because you always go there. You're always picking on Android. Uh, but if you have an Android device, if you've rooted it, and if you have also started sideloading applications, you are extremely vulnerable. So let's talk about the different flavors that are out there of mobile malware. Again, you can get this by going to my website at craigpeterson.com. You can do a little search there for the 10 flavors of mobile malware and use this. Keep this around because it's really important to know. So first up, we have spyware and malware. And these are all about invading your privacy in order to steal your personal information without you even knowing it. They collect passwords, they collect your location, and they sell them off to third parties who really don't have good intentions. These are the classic hosers that are trying to suck everything out of your accounts, right? Now, spyware and malware are depending on what they're doing, but they are really for any 
any machine, right? I'm not going to just pick an Android here because you can, of course, get spyware, malware of, for instance, browsing software. So it's using your browser, but most likely it's downloaded software. It's things like that really cool flashlight app, that really neat wallpaper. Both of those have been known as malware before, where they are used to deliver malware that then collects your contacts and then uses your phone to send out emails, phishing emails, as you to people you know, so that they're far more likely to open it. You got to be really careful about that. And the best thing to do is, again, do not root your phone. Don't try and get around the protections there. Keep your security updates on schedule or automatically downloaded. That's another nice thing about iOS devices, the iPhones. They just update themselves. Updates come out right away. When Apple has an update for one of these really serious vulnerabilities, they roll it out the next day it starts to roll out. And usually within a week, I think the statistic I saw is more than 80% of the iPhones have that patch within a week. That's important. You compare that with the average Android device, 80% of the Android devices have never, ever been patched. Does that tell you something, right? Again, that's one of the reasons you want to avoid most of the Android devices. Samsung has made a change recently where they are now committing to making sure that they provide security updates for their top-of-the-line phones, only the real expensive fancy ones, security updates for them for a five-year period. And Apple is typically providing them for five to seven years, sometimes even longer. So again, Apple is going to give you that update almost immediately. At Samsung, it's going to take three to six months on unusual schedules right sometimes they can get it done faster sometimes they don't even bother with them because they have to go from google over to samsung over to the software developers and maybe drivers have to change it, it can be a nightmare for them and that's one of the big advantages apple has frankly in the marketplace they control the hardware and the software so unlike google that has to worry about over 2,000 different android devices apple only is worrying about a few dozen iOS devices. That, that's a huge advantage, frankly, for you as a user. So the next one on the list is drive-by downloads. You might not be aware of it, but you can just visit a website and that website will potentially download malicious software. We first started seeing this on Windows computers and the problem was you didn't even know it was being downloaded. So Microsoft kind of cleaned up their act a little bit on this and stopped some of the drive-by downloads. The same thing is true for most of the other browsers out there. I was talking to one of our listeners helping her out this week, and she's been using the Brave browser. B-R-A-V-E from the Mozilla guys, that's Firefox people, and she really likes it. And, and it's, a frankly, a great browser that I recommend for privacy, okay, all in all. But when you're on some of these sketchy online websites, that's where you're most likely to get one of these drive-by downloads. You might be clicking on a malicious link on a website, and that can lead to disaster. Think of red light districts. I think that might be one good way to put it. And with these red light districts, you may well be in danger while you're in there, okay? So be very, very careful. And again, it'll often try and get your contact list and then, then send viruses out to people who you know. And now your reputation is ruined, right? With all of your friends, you don't want to open up any of your emails again because you just uh, spammed them, right? And maybe even gave them a virus, which is our next one, viruses and Trojans. Now, these usually are hiding in plain sight, especially Trojans. I mentioned a little bit earlier some of the software that's been known in the past to have malware inside of it. One of those pieces of software is the Flashlight app. 
that people were downloading that had malware inside of it that hosed all of the information that it could get out of your phone. Okay. So some of these things are Trojans. In other words, just like the Trojan horse looked like it was a gift, right? Oh yeah, it's a great gift. Let's bring it in. This is great. And inside, of course, were all kinds of uh, people who were going to attack them, right? Bad guys by their definition. So even seemingly legitimate apps can have these viruses and trojans on so one of the big pieces of advice in general on your smartphone is only have software on your smartphone that you use delete apps that you have not been using apple's great about that by the way apps that you haven't used in a while it offloads from the phone but if it's not on the phone if it, you've deleted it or it's been offloaded from the phone, it can't cause any damage. Does that make sense? So it's not on the phone. You've deleted it because you weren't using it. You're fine. The other thing to remember that's huge about apps again, especially in this day and age with the European Union going after the Apple Store and the Google Play Store is avoid downloading apps from third party website so we're going to be talking about that when we get back we're going to go into a lot more detail here uh, on the other seven that you need to know about here they're part of the 10 flavors of mobile malware what do you need to know what are they doing and what can you do about it make sure you get my newsletter every week it's absolutely free craigpeterson.com slash subscribe and if you have any questions just hit reply to the newsletter and we'll be glad to answer well, we've covered the first three flavors of mobile malware, the malware that's going after your smartphone. We're going to be talking now about some specifically designed to go after your smartphone and get into the last seven on my list. The European Union has been doing a few different things to try and make things, I, I think, ultimately better for their citizens. I, I look at it and I can see both sides, I think, of that sword. One of them, of course, a few years ago was what's called the GDPR. If you're in business and you do business inside the European Union, you are required to keep certain information confidential, not move it outside of the European Union's physical territory. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things that you have to do, including getting permission to track someone. Now, I can see that. I can see the advantages of something like that. They've also now basically forced Apple into putting USB-C connections on their iPhones and iPads because people were complaining, why do I have to have a special connector just to connect my iPhone to power and data? So, you know, I think that's a good point. I really love that connector that Apple's used for so long and replaced that big 30 pin connector. It's been nice. It can go on upside down or right side up. It doesn't really matter. There is no up or down. Well, the same thing is true with USB-C, although I think I think USB-C is slightly harder to put in, but only ever so slightly. So that now with your USB-C on your iPhone and your iPad, you can charge it just like every other device. In fact, if you bought a device that uses USB power in the last probably six months, it has come with a USB port on it that you're using for charging or for data collection, programming, etc. So there's some really good things about some of that. Well, another thing the European Union has done is they're now forcing companies like Apple and to a lesser extent Google to do or, or to allow what's called side loading. What side loading is, is you want to put an app on your phone? Go ahead. That's the basics of it. Apple has for a long time, folks, been restricting your applications that you can buy and that you can use to applications that you download for free or you pay for on the Apple's App Store. 
and Apple takes some serious time and examination looking at them. Okay, it's all automated. And looking for potential problems with it. It might be malicious. Are they trying to hose information out of you? What's really going on with that? Oh, they do all kinds of good stuff to try and make sure that you're safe. Google, of course, has the Google Play Store, which is also a great little store. And that store has built right into it all kinds of features, again, to try and keep you safe. Now, Apple has proven to be better at keeping apps safe than Google has, but they both work at it. They both try and they both do a very good job on that. Well, with the European Union now stepping in and trying to force Apple and Google to allow anybody to put up an app store that you can download apps from, life is changing. Just think about that now. What happens if Russia, some bad guys in North Korea or Iran or China or wherever... Let's say some of them put up their own little app store and they've got an app that looks just like Mario Kart. And you always wanted Mario Kart on your smartphone. And so it's all branded Mario Kart. It looks like Mario Kart. But you know what? It's cheaper than it is on the regular app store. So let's go over there and let's grab Mario Kart. Now, if you try and install that on your device... It, there are some checks and balances in there, but you know, when they ask for permission to get at the microphone or to access your contacts, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, yeah, most people just say, Yeah, okay, I, I want to play Mario Kart. Why, you know, I don't know why it's that, whatever, right? And you just click through, you click OK, everything's fine, don't worry about it. And in fact, in plain sight now, they have an app available on an app store that looks perfectly legitimate that you're allowed to download apps onto your iPhone or your Android phone. And it is, in fact, extremely malicious. That's going to be a side effect of what is happening in Europe right now. They may not allow this side loading, in other words, using third party apps on your iPhone in the United States, Canada and other areas, which is, I think, a pretty good thing. And when I first got my first smartphone, it was actually an Android phone. It was had LTE on it. It was a really cool phone, a high-end phone. And within just a matter of a few weeks, we returned them. We got we had two of them, my son and I, and we just couldn't stand it. It was just so buggy and so problematic. But of course, one of the first things we did was to take total control of the phone. We rooted the phone, and and uh, it was pretty cool because there you go. There's a little uh, Unix operating system underneath them well linux in fact on the android so we s turn those in and we switch them out for iphones never gone back because i don't want to mess with my phone it it's something i don't want to have to think about i have to think about my computer i have to think about the updates i have to think about the software that i install keep an eye on it work on it fix problems with it right yeah you, you have to do that I don't think that's the case for me anyways, when it comes to the smartphone, the smartphone is, is an appliance. It needs to just work. And maybe I get that because of all of the years of the telephone company. Anytime you pick it up, you've got dial tone, but folks, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a computer that is every bit as powerful as what was on your desk last year, or maybe even this year. That smartphone is a very fast, very capable computer. And the bad guys have been really focusing on those. They now have special malware that is targeted at mobile devices and even phishing scams, which are not just linked to emails anymore. You've seen those. They started out with the Nigerian scam right you remember those and it's moved on from there because they've adapted some of these for your mobile device to fit the screen to fit the what you're used to seeing on it 
So they're using fake apps now to hose your data out. Emails that are specifically designed to trick you into revealing your bank information or other sensitive details. They will might have a game that they're providing for free. Wow, on the App Store. Maybe even the legitimate app store and you are playing that game and up pops this little menu and it looks okay it looks pretty legitimate and you click on allow and off it goes and downloads something else or at the same time uploading bank account information other sensitive information it's really getting harder and harder for ordinary people to tell what's real from what's not we get uh, probably a half a dozen emails a week from our customers saying is this a legitimate email is this a legitimate invoice i just got one of those today i was looking at and one yesterday from a listener but about that whole microsoft scam right so be very very careful and the browsers that are on our smartphones are not completely safe either there's browser exploits that are specifically targeted at smartphones and it's a real problem right so again keep that software updated only download stuff from trusted sources that means from the stores the apple app store or the google play store and if you're using an android device you need to run regular security scans on it as well it might sound like a hassle but it's worth it hey we are about halfway through our list i want you to stick around because we've got more of the 10 flavors of mobile malware what you need to know and what you need to do craigpeterson.com online if you're like the rest of us you have a mobile smartphone and it's even more popular today to use that smartphone to go online to do shopping and just browse around than your desktop well we're going over some tips right now well, a little bit of safety goes a long way here, and we've got to be very careful with our mobile devices, particularly because we're using them more and more. I was looking at the stats on my CraigPeterson.com website just this week, and I was comparing mobile browsers, in other words, the browsers that are there on your smartphone or your tablet, to desktops. Now, it wasn't very long ago the desktops ruled. People were visiting my website using their desktop computers and browsers, and they were like 80, 90% of the users of my website. And so when I am sending out my newsletter every week, I was thinking, okay, what are they viewing it on? Well, they're viewing it on their desktop. They're reading their emails right there, and then clicking through. Therefore, I should make sure that my my website and my emails were all geared towards the desktop. What surprised me this week? Wow, that has completely flipped. Somewhere around 70 to 80% of the visits to craigpeterson.com are from smartphones. Now, I don't think I'm giving away any insider secrets here. People who are in marketing probably have seen this with their clients as well. But to me, it was a bit of a surprise. But what it tells me when we're talking about these 10 tips is we need to be careful because the hosers, the bad guys know this too. So they are putting these nasty little pieces of Trojan software, viruses, etc. on your phone as part of apps, as part of a website, kind of a drive-by download using JavaScript nowadays. And those are designed specifically for your smartphones. There was one that was going around and it was being distributed by an ad network. Ad networks are where people will have a business and they want to advertise. And so they'll go to an ad network that puts ads up on multiple websites and the ads will show up that are kind of geared towards you. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, right? That way a vendor doesn't have to go and talk to a hundred different owners of different websites. They just deal with the ad network. 
while the ad network was showing ads that had drive-by malware on them. They had not been paying close attention to who their customers really were, the customers buying the ads. And that caused everyone a lot of headaches. So that still can happen. In, in the case I'm thinking about, maybe even the worst case, they weren't taking your data. They weren't grabbing your bank account information. They weren't grabbing any of your contacts. What they were interested in is the fact that your smartphone is a pretty fast little computer. So they had JavaScript, which is a programming language that's used for web browsers and is used to display stuff on your screen. They were writing programs for a web browser to run, the web browser on your smartphone that did Bitcoin mining. Imagine that. And so they were, in some cases, literally burning up people's smartphones because the people had them in a case and the smartphone wasn't designed to dissipate that heat, to get rid of the heat from all of that computation stuff going on. And also, of course, burning through the charge in the matter of an hour or two on the smartphone. So some of that stuff's been fixed. But again, just because you're on that smartphone doesn't mean you're safe, particularly, again, if it's an Android smartphone. Now, mobile ransomware is something most people haven't even thought about. Ransomware is something that we pay attention to on our computers. And to help combat ransomware, what do we do? Well, we, we might put firewalls in. We, for our clients, provide multiple different filtration systems for their email to make sure that ransomware isn't getting through. Of course, it, it can fail, but we've been quite successful at that. But how about your smartphone? Are you paying attention to potential ransomware? You know, clicking on your smartphone can be just as dangerous as clicking a link on your desktop as well. And what happens with ransomware? Well, it encrypts everything it can get its hands on and then demands a ransom for the key to unlock them. Many of us are using backup systems for our computers. You might be using an iPhone and you use iCloud to back up your phone, for instance. I certainly do. There's pros and cons to that, just like everything, right? But if you can't pay up, you're going to lose your data. But if you have a really good backup of your smartphone, it doesn't matter because you can just do a restore. It's very, very good. And the malware creators have gotten smarter too. They're using the improved smartphone performance and anonymous networks that our phones connect to, which includes, of course, the 5G or even newer technologies to get out to spread the malware to other people even faster than ever before. Let's not forget about spyware as we're going through this. This is something that could be right there under our noses. And it can collect sensitive data and it can spy on us without us ever expecting or suspecting a thing. We just had a major patch that was released uh, by, by a vendor, uh, but what, what really uh, that covered one of these pieces of spyware. But what really hits me is the Barracuda spam firewall. A lot of businesses use them to try and prevent spam. And as it turns out, for I think it was seven months, the Barracuda spam firewall had been completely compromised and was being used to get into networks, monitor networks, do all kinds of nasty stuff. And it got to the point where Barracuda said, okay, we can't fix this. Uh, let us know and we'll send you a new one. And it turned out, I read an article a couple of weeks ago that even with that, the Barracuda spam firewall still was vulnerable. They had not been able to fully patch it. So, you know, keep your eyes on it. Anyways, spyware can be a problem. Now, there's also something called MMS malware or SMS malware. It's been more on the MMS line. This is when you send a picture or a video via a text message to someone else. Now, it doesn't have to be text message. It can be any sort of a message where you're sending a video. 
to someone. And what the bad guys have been doing is crafting malware that basically lives inside a picture or lives inside a video or even a voicemail message so that when your smartphone starts playing that video or opens the picture, it is now infected. And that's what that Israeli group has been doing, the NGO group with their malware that has been used by governments to hack into people's phones, including iPhones, by the way. Uh, Absolutely a a huge problem, huge problem. Android systems have had a bit more of a problem with that as well. And these are specially crafted text messages can give them full root access, which is basically unlimited access to your phone so be careful google has patched up most of these vulnerabilities apple has as well but be careful when you are getting text messages it doesn't necessarily uh, require you to click on a link zero action on your part so be careful and then of course mobile adware Yeah, you know, we can be forced to download software we don't want when you click on the ads. So be very, very careful. Um, By the way, March 2023, Google sounded the alarm bells about not one, not two, but 18 bugs lurking in the Android operating system. They're out there. So let's be careful. Visit me online, craigpeterson.com. We got a couple of great articles this week on electric vehicles. Those things are so cool. Uh, The neat, neat technology. But we've been exploding the myths about EVs. And we've got more myths to explode today. Well, we've been worried about our passwords getting hacked. Good passwords. We talked about that how many times? Well, how about the roads getting cracked? Get it? (laughs) By these heavy electric vehicles. A lot of people haven't really thought about this. When you look at the road taxes, the taxes that are supposedly used to pay for road maintenance, and you probably know why I said supposedly used, those taxes are typically collected from fuel correct so you've got gasoline taxes that pay for the roads supposedly you have diesel taxes in fact the reason diesel so expensive has a lot to do with the taxes on diesel diesel trucks used to pay an over the road yearly fee could amount to nine ten thousand dollars maybe even more in order to help pay for the roads so why would a diesel truck need to pay more in road taxes than your car or your suv well it's simple wait the trucks weigh a whole lot and almost all of the wear and tear i think the last number i saw from the federal government was that about 98 percent of the road damage is caused by heavy trucks on the roads there's only one or two percent that's caused by your car so no doubt about it by the way we are subsidizing trucks going over the roads with our other taxes that we're paying right now including the again the gas tax that's part of the reason we don't use trains as much here as they do in some other parts of the world because again trains had some real subsidies and all to get in all that land but they can be far more efficient and they can handle the weight really really well their trains everything about them is designed to handle weight lots of it now how about your cars how about your evs did you know that electric cars let's take a look at an electric vehicle like an suv the batteries in that ev weigh more than about 50 popular other gasoline cars so the the batteries in your ev suv weigh as much as a toyota corolla or a honda civic in fact they weigh more they weigh about 2000 they weigh about a ton just for the batteries isn't that something so where does that lead us well that leads us now to this recent study 
that's suggesting that electric vehicles cause twice as much road damage as their gasoline counterparts. Isn't that something? So we need to weigh the pros and cons of the emission cuts and road ruts. We've got to keep an eye on this. Again, it's something that's really overlooked. And then on top of it all, how much gas does that EV buy, buy, right? How much does it burn or buy? Unless you're like this picture I saw of an electric car pulling a small trailer and the trailer was covered, but in the back of the trailer was a little gasoline generator that was plugged into the car to keep it going because he wanted to go on a longer trip. I just thought that was absolutely hilarious. Uh, but something like that, okay, maybe that's uh, burning some gasoline as it's going down the road. But EVs don't burn gas, so they don't pay road taxes. They don't burn diesel, so they don't pay exorbitant road taxes. So who's paying for the roads? Well, anybody who has a regular gasoline or diesel vehicle. Who's damaging the roads? Well, more than twice the damage uh, is being caused by an EV compared to a gasoline vehicle. So keep that in mind. Some states now are going to be charging EVs an additional fee when the vehicle is registered every year, when that license is renewed. And they're saying $100 per EV. Some states are more. I haven't heard any states that are less. But expect that to happen. You are going to be taxed, right? Death and taxes. I put in my newsletter, this came from my wife. I thought this is great. So uh, when these electric cars' batteries overheat and burst into flames, is it still considered a zero emissions car? I thought that was pretty funny, so I included it in the newsletter this week. But it's a legitimate question. and That comes from the hurricane that they had down in Florida. Do you remember Hurricane Ian hit shore i think it was up around the panhandle a lot of waterlogged cars up there and of course you got to be careful if you're buying a used car make sure it was not underwater but this particular waterlogged car uh was electric so what happens well there are a ton of electric vehicles that were disabled because of the hurricane the storm coming on to ground. So as those electric vehicle batteries corrode, fires start. When they get in accidents and the battery compartment's damaged, and by the way, the whole bottom of the electric car is a battery compartment. And what they're working on right now is moving those batteries all over the car. So the A pillar, B pillar, those like the B pillar is that that pillar that goes between the front door and the back door, just give you an idea, those will be filled with batteries as well. Can you imagine that, right? So if you're in a, a head-on collision, a rear-end collision, a side collision, you're pretty much guaranteed to have that car catch fire because of the shorting in those batteries. And the electric vehicles, you might have noticed, cost a lot more to insure because they're so expensive to repair. Many times, an accident that would be fixable, very fixable, on your gasoline car causes a complete write-off when it comes to your electric car because of the potential damage to the batteries and the battery compartment in there. I, I just saw another 30.30% drop in the value of electric cars now on the used market and the federal government to try and encourage people to buy and use electric car don't worry people if you buy one and you might have to pay twenty thousand dollars for a new battery for your car you just don't know it's used but don't worry we'll give you a three thousand dollar credit to buy a used electric car yeah, it's kind of crazy. By the way, it takes special training to be able to put out one of these fires on electric vehicles, and it takes thousands of gallons of water to put them out as well. Isn't that something? So Florida and California, the two uh, states with the largest number of electric cars on the road out there. 
We got another green story for you here. Sweden, who is a country that decided they weren't going to bow a knee to the whole COVID craziness that happened, right? They did not do the lockdowns. They did not mandate the jab. They did not mandate the wearing of the masks. They did not close their schools. They did not force people indoors. And now the statistics are showing that, yes, it was a great idea because fewer people died right it's just like people getting the jab president biden uh, getting uh, covid again his wife getting covid again right if, if the apparently the average number of times that you got covid if you got the jab was three three times and uh, i i had covid i think everybody's got it by now right and uh, i only had it once and it really wasn't too bad so lucky me i guess is the bottom line but sweden set another milestone that maybe we should pay some attention to sweden has decided it wants to be green what does that mean well they figured out that in fact green does not mean solar panels it does not mean windmills it does not mean ocean power it means nuclear power you know, the so-called green power that many people have, many states are using, is unstable. We need power in order to live. We need power in order to run our businesses, in order to grow our food. We need power to pump the water out of the ground and purify it. Everything needs power. So if you're building solar farms or you're building windmill farms, there will be times when neither one of those works. So where do you get your power from? Well, as it turns out, you need nuclear. So Sweden has said, forget about that. We're just going to have uh, nuclear power. You know, if you want to have your own little production go right ahead right and this is a severe blow to the global climate agenda and sweden has completely scrapped their so-called green energy credits because remember uh, windmills are not green solar panels are not even close to being green when you consider the manufacturing the distribution and then ultimately the disposal of all of these things it's not green at all so we've got to be very very careful um they've uh, they have completely abandoned their goal of 100 percent so-called renewable energy and i want to point out while we're talking about nuclear one of the really neat things about the new nuclear plants is there are nuclear technologies today where the plant is manufactured in a factory no more problems with okay we didn't build this right that didn't line up you're using a contractor that has never poured the right kind of concrete for this type of reactor etc it's built in a factory and shipped to the location they are inherently safe intrinsically safe in fact they don't have to have anyone monitor them they don't have to have cooling systems they are phenomenal and some of these new nuclear power plants use spent nuclear fuel from the old nuclear reactors that are out there. Talking about a win-win and Sweden's leading away, throwing away the stupidity of some of this green movement. And I got to put this in massive Nebraska solar park completely smashed to pieces by a hailstorm yeah millions of dollars down the tubes and of course no electricity from that panel anymore not just panel but that old field visit me online craigpeterson.com and remember to subscribe right now well we've been talking about ai for a very long time and now we're going to talk about some of the major issues that this generative ai which is really chat gpt and everybody else has lawsuits are flying i talked about this a little while ago and it's finally making it into the online media We've got what's called artificial intelligence, and of course, it is not intelligent at all, 
right, is generative artificial intelligence, generative AI. So what it's doing is it is being fed a whole lot of information. I read an article talking about some 5,000 people working in third world countries that are training open AI. Some of these AIs, it's just incredible, are being trained by asking a question and then answering it for them. And then they kind of put two and two together and they figure out, okay, well, this is the way that would work. And so puts it together. And in fact, it's really even surprised some of its creators as to how it has been able to assemble things, look at different things and kind of pull them together, which is also how they've been able to come up with some pretty amazing cures for a number of different things types of diseases it's also how they have been able to beat some of these chess players and even go which is a very difficult game very simple basic rules but a very very difficult game to play when you get down to it and certainly to master so it's out there getting fed this information by individuals much of that information is being garnered from online websites and then the ais are kind of let loose to do a different type of training which is go find stuff online and kind of learn about it now there's problems with that which is why there's thousands of people who are working on training ais and not the least of the problems is that it is picking up some you know some bad information or it's putting together some incorrect stuff as it tries to really go out and and uh, handle you know all of this massive amount of data can you imagine how much data there is out there on the internet that's publicly available and we're going to talk about some of those problems here too so it's out there trying to figure out okay what do i need to learn how how does this tie into that and it's using these hundreds of thousands of manual training pieces that have been put together and it comes up with some amazing answers if you've ever used chat gpt or some of the others like bard and if you're a microsoft user you probably have used ChatGPT because Microsoft has made it available as part of their Bing search engine. They're making kind of a Clippy comeback. For those of you who remember Clippy, where the Windows operating system and the various Microsoft Office programs, as they used to be called, have this kind of AI built into them. So it's interesting to watch and to see what's happening. But ultimately, we're seeing some serious, serious issues from a number of different sides. First of all, the content that's generated by AI is at best mediocre. Well, okay, at best average. Let's, let's just put it that way. It's at best average. Why? Well, because what it's reading online, it's putting together. It has humans helping to put stuff together. And, and you can see an example of that, by the way, humans helping to put stuff together by asking it for a joke. I saw a study where they asked it a thousand times for a joke. And usually the AIs will come up with slightly different answers every time. But they found that there really was, uh, I think it was three different jokes that the AI knew, and that was it. It gave slightly different variations of them over the, those thousand iterations, but that's what it was. It was the same joke over and over again. That's what we're starting to see. This mediocre content and that mediocre content that's coming out of the artificial intelligence out there like the chat gpts of the world is then being used to write books and there's some estimates out there that a good 20 to 30 percent of all of the books for sale right now on amazon are generated by ais and yeah isn't that something when you get right down to it, it it's can you trust it well no because ai hallucinates a lot and we've talked about that sort of stuff before so it's out there being used to generate books being used to generate web content now that all ties back into the training how is it being trained well the ais have been crawling through websites particularly websites like uh, the reddits of the world and twitters and wikipedia and many others so it has all of this information that it gleaned from online and that information is being used to generate websites 
and the website that's generating are at best moderate, but for the most part kind of mediocre. And then it is continuing to be trained. And what's it being trained on now? Well, some of that mediocre website data, isn't it? Because it's starting to read in its own output. Maybe mangled a little bit by humans, maybe not. And that now is making what used to be, uh, you know, average content uh, through mediocre content to now be completely mediocre content. Something I predicted months and months ago. And I have really noticed it myself because I use AI as a research assistant. Because sometimes it comes up with some really great thoughts that I hadn't had, right? Uh, Obviously, the AI isn't thinking, but it's putting together different relationships and stuff. And so we use some of that to write some of the articles. And it does a pretty darn good job of that, but not writing itself. So it's out there crawling around. And that's causing a lot of problems. The problem I just mentioned, which is the content just keeps getting worse day by day. And the other big problems, we're going to spend a little bit of time on those right now. One of them, I have a great article from Harvard Business Review in front of me. And if you're interested, I can probably dig it up and send it off to you. But it's called Generative AI has an intellectual property problem. And if you're a user of Reddit, you know about this. And same thing is basically true with Twitter. And some interesting things have happened at Twitter. We'll talk about those as well. But companies out there are now getting upset because all of this content that they've curated is now being used by these AIs. And the generative AIs are now charging for you to use them, and yet the content does not belong to the AIs. The content on the internet doesn't belong to Google. It doesn't belong to OpenAI. It doesn't belong to any of these companies that have the AIs. That's why they have an intellectual property problem. Because they're going out there, scraping all of this. Now, what's interesting to me, I I think it's almost ironic. Well, I guess it is ironic that these companies whose sites are getting scraped, such as Wikipedia, such as Reddit, are using content on their sites generated by you and me for free right? We're not charging them for it. We're making comments in there. People are going in and editing the Wikipedia articles. And then the AIs come through and read those articles and then sell the results. Have you noticed you have to now pay uh, 20 bucks a month for using ChatGPT4 and it isn't very good. In, in fact, they've got limits as to how many queries you can do over how many hours. You know, that's been changing up and down a little bit. But the OpenAI guys are getting a lot of usage. It's estimated that half of the Americans have been using it. And some people have estimated that somewhere around a quarter of the world's population has been using it. Now, that is huge. And it's causing some huge problems. You know, it can seem like magic. I don't know if you've used or if you've seen, well, you've probably seen the output if you've been online, but things like Stable Diffusion or Midjourney. I've used DALI, and I use DALI too in order to generate some of the graphics from our website because it's quick and it's easy and I can get specific graphics generated quite easily. You get into things like Stable Diffusion and Midjourney. And it will blow your mind. The the graphics, the pictures that I have Dali make are pretty rudimentary, pretty simple. It's just to have some decent graphics on my web page. But these other ones are able to produce amazing artwork and are already being used to produce movies. You might have seen, uh, this was, uh, I think, beginning 2023-ish, and the Republican National Committee came out with a TV commercial, and that TV commercial 
had all kinds of pictures of what will happen if President Biden is reelected. And they showed pictures of all kinds of devastation and real riots and bombs being dropped. And man, they looked really good. And they were all generated by artificial intelligence. So the ability to be able to tell if it's AI or not is uh, kind of non-existent, really. Yeah, yeah, there are some programs out there that claim to be able to recognize artificial intelligence-generated content. But I can tell you with a large amount of certainty, I have tried all of the big ones, and I have fed them in AI content with minor changes to it, and it has never detected AI content. In fact, once one thing I had written myself from scratch, it said was AI content. So we have a long way to go there, but man, we're only getting started right now. Now, the AIs have been proven to be really good sometimes with writing poems and essays and summaries, and they're great at mimicking different types of style and form, but they have a lot of factual problems out there. The Museum of Modern Art in New York hosted this AI-generated installation. It was all generated from the museum's own collection. And they also had a variant of Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring, which is just an amazing painting, while the original was away on loan. Now, I'm looking at the winner of all of these generative AI pictures that they had received as submissions to replace the real paintings and things that were there in the Museum of Modern Art. And I am amazed. It is absolutely gorgeous what they're able to do. Now, Harvard Business Review has a great article on this whole problem with generative AI tied into intellectual property. And of course, that's the most valuable part of pretty much any company out there is what is its intellectual property? What is it that the company has that gives it that unique proposition in the marketplace and in this case when we're talking about intellectual property uh, there is none when it comes to ais the courts have already ruled now this is going to be appealed and moved up and up and up but there's been a court already here in the u.s it's ruled that anything generated by artificial intelligence is not copyrightable because the copyright law specifically talks about basically human generated content which it is not but is it not really you know what is it really is it what because it's generative ai in other words it's taking things that it has found online and kind of putting it together and they can just be absolutely remarkable if you've ever played with them they're striking and it's worth playing with it's worth signing up there are some apps out there chat gpt has its own free app that you can use if you want to pay you can get in you know the latest version of chat gpt as well you got to pl play with it because it, it's amazing it seems like it's legit and it's human which is why some of these lawyers have gotten themselves into trouble because they're quoting cases that don't really exist right kind of on and on out there but they are conjuring new material from what from nowhere but that that's not really the case it's not really coming up with something new they're trained on massive amounts of data they're trained by people putting in questions and answers they're trained by crawling websites and causing problems we just had a problem with twitter where elon musk at the end of june had his uh, contract uh, up for renewal over at amazon web services which is apparently where Twitter had been hosting all of its uh, processing power, right, and, and probably much of the storage. Apparently, by the way, he owed a billion dollars to Amazon. I love this. I love this saying, too. If you haven't heard this before, right, if you owe the bank $50,000 that you can't pay, you've got a problem. If you owe the bank a billion dollars that you can't pay, 
the bank has a problem and in this case obviously it's amazon that had had the problem with all of this but because people wrote software that was crawling twitter twitter had to put limits on it and that's what we saw there because of everything that happened at the end of june with the contract going away well we're seeing the same sort of thing with reddit where Reddit came out and said, wait a minute now, we've got all of these discussion boards, we've been collecting all of this information, we've been making money off of it by selling advertising, but you guys who use Reddit, you know, good for you. I so appreciate you giving us all of this wonderful information for free. And now Reddit saying, hey, 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 you guys can't crawl Reddit and use all of this information for free. Just because we got it for free doesn't mean you get to do it, get it for free. Now, what's interesting to me is a lot of the administrators who have been, again, working for free for Reddit have said, hey, forget about it. We're now blocking access to all of the content in our subreddits, in our basically a little bulletin board. And the, the reason that's kind of interesting is uh, what right do they have to do that? Whose data is it? And man, is there a whole lot of question about that? And that question is going to be around for a long time because whose is it? You put a lot of stuff up on Facebook, and Facebook's got this Twitter competitor out there. Read the terms on it, and you'll see Facebook collects everything it possibly can about you. And that's how they make their money, right? That's the old Zuckerberg way. Just fool you into giving up all of this personal information and finding out who your people are in your social circles, who's in your family, so that they can sell all that information. And they're doing it now with their latest little innovation that I'm not going to name over at Facebook Meta that's supposedly going to compete with Twitter. But who owns your information on facebook in reality it goes back to that expression that i've used for the last 20 years if you're not paying for something on the internet you are the product right except for my email list <laughs> uh, but you're not paying for it right who's paying for it well people or these businesses these social media sites are selling your information so they can make money so whose information is it really uh, with reddit with twitter with uh, wikipedia whose information is it and now that they're shutting down access reddit said hey listen you want to find out all of the stuff people are posting you need to pay us millions of dollars a year now there had been a great little relationship with some of these software developers who were using the reddit apis to tie into reddit and make a really nice little app for you or website so you could follow your favorite topics uh, those things were all well and good until reddit decided no we're going to charge now as i said millions of dollars for these companies to access the apis which these small guys can't do a number of them just immediately said we're gone on, we can't afford this forget it and many of them also had a pay model so they're refunding the money that you had given to them for their little app that tied into reddit you see, you see how this is cascading and a lot of people are saying hey uh, don't accept the refund because these poor companies just got worked over by the guys that own reddit again who owns the data Reddit can shut it down. Reddit can charge for it. The same thing's true with almost everything out there. So when we get into the generative AI platforms that are out there, that are crawling everything, that are taking all of this information, whose information is it? Who owns it? And now we're finding out that these companies with these generative AI platforms are actually programming them purposely to have a strong left-wing bend to them that is really something to think about isn't it so they're taking billions of different parameters they've got software that's processing these massive archives of images and texts and and podcasts like my podcast i'm sure ended up in there 
And these AI platforms are then being used to find patterns, to find relationships, and they use those to create these rules that we've talked about before, and then make judgments and predictions when they're responding to a prompt. And when they're responding to a prompt, they're really only looking at uh, what's the next word that I need to put into the response. They're not thinking it through. They don't think any of this thing through. But it's still phenomenal. But it comes with real legal risks, which you as an individual and you as a business could certainly be facing these risks without even knowing about it. So we'll talk about that here. Come up in just a couple of minutes. Who owns this? Copyright? Patent laws? Trademark infringement? What applies when we're talking about AI? Hey, visit me online, craigpeterson.com. I guess if we were to boil it down, the real question here is who owns the internet? Because that's what we're talking about, isn't it? All of these websites are all being crawled, information created for free. Who owns it? Well, that's a legal conundrum. So this whole process where they are looking at these massive data sets of images, of text, of audio, create some serious legal risks. So we're talking about intellectual property infringement as one of them. But in many cases, according to the Harvard Business Review, uh, we have to consider some other things because uh, unresolved things, by the way, who... Who does copyright, patent, trademark infringement apply to? Is it the AI creation? Is it the creator? Is it the company that makes the AI? It's clear who owns content that the generative AI platforms create for you. Or is it clear? Because we already know about at least one case that said, no, you cannot copyright things that are generated by AI. So before we can really embrace the benefits of this generative AI, we need to understand the risks and how to protect ourselves, okay? So courts are still sorting this out. It's going to be years, right? Even the laws aren't there yet on the books. And and which ones that are already there should be applied? You know, for the longest time, I've said, do we really need new laws? There's more than 20,000 thousand gun control laws on the books 20,000 plus just on gun control do we really need one more is it do we need a special law about killing a federal poultry inspector we have laws on the books about murder common law it's been around for a long long time in fact the federal government didn't get involved with murder statutes until after president kennedy was assassinated And they were all upset because, oh, my gosh, we have to uh, follow Texas law when it comes to prosecuting someone that killed the president of the United States. Then it just blossomed right more and more and more and more till they get to the point where there's a specific statute on killing a federal poultry inspector. Right. Do we do we need that? No, we don't. So. How about laws when we're talking about generative AI? Do we have laws that could be applied or should be applied? Or do we need another 20,000 laws on the books about AI? Because in reality, we're talking about copyright infringement. There's a very good case, interesting case out there right now where a couple of authors are suing because what has happened is they asked the AI, I think it was ChatGPT, to summarize their books individually. So give me a summary of this book. Give me an extensive summary of this book. And it was a book that they had written. And the AI gave it an excellent summary of the book. So you might be thinking, well, that's great. Isn't that cool? So now uh, when my kids, grandkids, or me have to do a book report, all I have to do is ask for an extensive summary from ChatGPT, and they'll give it to you. Well, the problem is that the fact that ChatGPT could generate an extensive summary of these authors' books means 
that ChatGPT had ingested, had digested, had read those books, doesn't it? Well, those books are copyrighted. Now, it's perfectly legal for me as a commentator right now. I could read you a part of any book out there. And there are laws about that fair use doctrine uh, that applies differently in a school as it would in a general commentary or comedic work, right? There's all kinds of laws that kind of vary court precedent to let you know what can you do? How much can you do it? Well, in this case, is that summary, exhaustive summary of the book, an infringement on the copyright of the author? Right. If I was to write a summary of a book and was to publish it, an exhaustive summary, how much of that book could I quote as a critical piece? Well, as a critical piece, I could quote a whole lot of that book without getting in any trouble. But how about an AI? That AI is charging me 20 bucks a month or whatever it is for access to the AI that AI has obviously ingested copyrighted works. Same thing's true for these graphical things that like I was talking about a little bit earlier with this really cool uh, museum piece or a number of them actually from the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. So they had a whole AI generated installation. Well, one of the things you can ask the AI to do is, for instance, write in the style of, and you name somebody, whether it's a marketer or an author, well-known author, uh, and uh, it, it will spit it out in that style. I tried a bunch of different styles just to, to see what it would do, and it does, and it can. So is that also some sort of a violation of, of copyright? In this case, certainly it is you know, taking something from someone else without their permission, right? which is the style. Problems. You see the problems that are coming out of this stuff here? So what's going to happen? Well, the courts are going to start looking at this, and I think what's going to end up happening is if the courts cannot come up with a clear interpretation, then we're going to see even more laws that come down to the point of, uh, well, you can't quote a federal poultry inspector using AI, right? It's going to be that kind of stuff. Well, some of these claims have already been litigated. There's a case that was filed late 2022. It's called Anderson versus Stability AI and all. And three artists formed a class to sue multiple generative AI problem or platforms on the basis of the AI using their original works without license to train their AI in their styles. Great piece here. You should look it up at Harvard Business Review. So it was allowing users to generate works that may be insufficiently transformative from their existing protected works. Transformative. Now, you've heard about some of these cases, I'm sure, of musicians where they got sued because, oh, no, your, your beat, your, your rhythm, the, uh, the, the tone, the uh, underlying music theme is mimicking mine. And therefore, it's a derivative work. And not just how derivative is it? How much is it transformed? Is it providing something to the culture, right? There's lots of things that the courts consider in these types of cases. But um, in this case, it was interesting because the, what does it mean? What's going to happen? Well, if the court finds AI's works are unauthorized and, and derivative, there are substantial infringement penalties that can apply. And that's exactly what is happening when you're using something like Dolly or one of the even better pieces of software out there ai software that generate pictures like for instance uh, we've got this lawsuit with getty now getty has all of these images that it's collected that it licenses getty filed a lawsuit against stable diffusion which is an amazing uh, picture generator alleging improper use of its photos because when asked some of these ai photo generators were actually including a copyright that was over the image, which is what Getty does 
in their derivative works. Now, uh, what? Watermarked, photographed, copyrights in a obviously derivative work from an AI. Interesting. We have more to talk about this, too. So stick around and make sure you're on my email list. Get my weekly newsletter, craigpeterson.com. Law follows technology. When the law tries to get ahead of technology, they really mess things up, which is uh, pretty much what they did with nuclear power, by the way. But you, you need to know what the real issues are before you can pass any rules or regulations or laws. Obviously, this isn't something new. I, I want you to think back to Google and Google's founding. What does Google do? You go online, you go to Google, and you search for something. All right, that, that concept of a search engine has been around a long time. I used to love Alta Vista. I used to use Archie and Veronica and Jughead, right? All of these uh, FTP searches and stuff we used to do. I, in fact, I ran servers for all of those for my business but uh, google it started out as okay basic search engine here's the site you should look at and then they started getting smarter and made more recommendations using some some different technologies basically looking at link tracking how many people linked to this page and that told google uh, how important that page was and of course we had the problem of all of these link factories and stuff going on blah blah right well google got sued because there was an argue or a lawsuit that said hey wait a minute now it's one thing for you to go and find my content online so that people can find me right because you go to google if you want to look up craig peterson i want you to find me not some crazy football player, <laughs> okay? Uh, so people weren't complaining about that too much. But then the news media started to complain because there were what were called deep links. So Google would give you a link to that specific article, and the newspapers argued, wait a minute now, uh, you, you can certainly send someone to my website and then they can kind of go through our website and find that article. But you can't send them right to that article. Obviously, in the U.S., it, it lost that argument. In the Europe, it actually kind of stood for a while. And now there have been lawsuits against Facebook and others saying, wait a minute now, especially again in Europe and England, you cannot make money off of my news reporting, Google. Because Google, Facebook, is the same problem. They are a lot of people's news sources, if you can believe that. But okay, that is what that is. And they are just taking data, scraping it, is what the technology is called, from the newspaper's website and was were putting it on to Google's website. You probably remember, I don't remember, it was five plus years ago when Google all of a sudden started including snippets on the results page. So what it was doing now, you would do a search and a little snippet would come up and it was scraping the text from from books and web pages, etc. So you could see what the context was and then you decide am i going to go to that page or not it's it's still doing that it's been doing that for a long time right underneath the title of the page it's got the little snippet well who has the rights to that snippet that, that was the question and google defended itself obviously successfully against the lawsuit saying well it's transformative use. We're pulling out some of the keywords, key phrases that are of interest to the Google user and putting them up there. So it allowed uh, the court the scraping of text from books to create a search engine. And for the time being, that decision is what remains precedent for what's happening with AI. In other words, Google was permitted to scrape books to in, in ingest books in order for to have a, a, a re result that it would show that something small okay well that's one thing it's what uh, 20 words or something is it's not a whole lot that comes up in that google search result but now we're talking about generative ai that has ingested these books has ingested these web pages 
So now what applies? When you sign up, for instance, I signed up for, for um, Google's Bard, which is their AI. And so if I use Google for a search, and I only use Google for technical searches, if I want to search anything else, I know Google does all kinds of politically, politically based uh, filtering. So I use DuckDuckGo, right, for all of those. But what will happen now is when I do a search on Google, it either will automatically or ask me if I want to generate an AI search result as well. So right at the top of the Google search page, it'll have a summary explaining whatever it was I searched for. Again, that summary is from where? Well, it's from these websites. So who owns it? It's one thing to have 20 words in a little summary, but how about something that's a few hundred words long? Right, so that's where we're going to be going here. Uh, but there's other non-technological cases that Harvard Business Review is talking about here that could shape how the products of generative AI are treated. So there's a case before the U.S. Supreme Court against the Andy Warhol Foundation. You know who that is. And this case is brought by photographer Lynn Goldsmith, who had a licensed, who had licensed an image of Andy Warhol. Oh no, excuse me, of Prince. That's what it was. And this could refine U.S. copyright on the issue of when a piece of art is sufficiently different from the source material to become unequivocally transformative. So I think that's probably where they're going to go, come down, because it is transformative. It's, it's not like pulling out the whole book or pulling out my whole web page, it's taking it and moving around and shuffling it. But then if that's the case, what incentive is there for a publisher to write a book and put it up? That's why we have copyright laws. That's why we have patent laws, although there's serious problems with current patent laws. But so that it's, we can encourage innovation, we can encourage writing. Right, and that's the reason copyrights used to expire fairly quickly. So derivative works could be made and benefit society as a whole. So if the court finds that the Warhol piece is not a fair use, it could mean trouble for these AI-generated works. So there's just all kinds of potential prom problems here. Now, what would happen if a business used some of this AI generated either pictures or text. Well, here's your bottom line. You could be on the hook for willful, willful infringement, and that can include damages up to $150,000 for each instance of knowing use. So that's why when I do research using, uh, let's say, ChatGPT or one of these derivatives, I always follow up with my own research and I run it through copyright checkers to make sure that it isn't stealing something directly from someone. And then, of course, I always move stuff around and rewrite it because it's usually kind of wrong when you get right down to it. So you got to got to make sure you are in compliance. Developers need to be a lot more cautious stability ai these are the stable diffusion guys they've announced that artists will be able to opt out of the next generation of stable diffusions image generator but that's putting the task the onus on the people who are creating the content to actively protect their ip it's kind of like takedown notices that came out of the millennial um digital millennial copyright act right dm dcma yeah millennial act um dmca there you go thank you so that's what it is kind of like so you have to proactively say that's my copyrighted work take it down but how are you going to know uh, how are you going to be able to tell if it's derivative uh, it, it can be derivative to the point where it uses the same types of brush strokes strokes at least it looks like brush strokes right um, are, are you going to be able to scan for that? It's one thing to search online for certain phrases or words or even chapters of your book. See how this is getting really, really difficult. 
it's getting very difficult. So, and then the companies that are making the AIs have to have some audit trails showing how was this generated. And I can tell you right now, the companies that are making AI are saying, we don't even know some of the time exactly how, what it's doing. It, they were surprised in some cases that the AI, quote, taught itself, unquote, a new language. They had no idea it understood that language. So how are they going to have the audit trail? How are they going to prove that they didn't use an Andy Warhol picture of a, a, a tomato soup can? Uh, how can they prove that if they can't audit it because they don't know what it's doing? It, this just, man, this just goes on and on. Because you can't just look for specific elements like a Nike swoosh, right? Or, you know, Tiffany down in New York City, that a jewelry store has their their blue color, right? It's It's theirs. It's unique to them. So how can you trademark this stuff? How can you copyright it? It's it's just going on and on. How oh, this is a problem for business owners. Um, I did a, a really great. Well, people told me it was a great seminar. It was fun for me, anyways, about AI and how to use it. I demonstrated a bunch of different AIs. I don't know if I should do that again. I'd be glad to do it. We had a lot of home users on. Uh, some current and former teachers, too, which was interesting to me because they made up a disproportionate number or percentage of the audience when I did it. Not that I have a problem with that. I think it's great. And we had some great discussions about it. Um, but I'm kind of wondering if I shouldn't try and do some sort of a webinar on this right? Uh, how can you as a business be safe when your employees are using these generative AIs? How can you avoid some of the pitfalls and lawsuits that might come? So uh, there's a lot of things that I think we have to really seriously consider here. The courts are going to be considering, which I think is kind of a wonderful thing too. But when we get right down to it today, what do you do? And if you'd like me to do a web, and I do these things for free, when people enough people ask me, make sure you email me, me at craigpeterson.com. Let me know what you'd like me to cover. Be glad to do it. No two ways about it. All right, so I want to make sure you guys know, go online, check me out, and sign up for my free newsletter, craigpeterson.com. 